Thank you. Hey, thank you, Ben. Uh, so, uh, yeah, indeed, there is a place for us, right? Grace to you, peace to you, welcome to you. I saw some of you actually, uh, your, your, your lips were moving to, uh, to the song, and so uh, we should give you a microphone. And so, <laughs> no, you won't, okay. <laughs> well, again, good morning to you all. I call your attention to announcements that are there in the Nuggets. Take a look at all the different things that are going on. We want to uh, lift up that we have a electronics recycling drive that is coming up and also a blood drive that is coming up. And then also this is a special push for Plug-In Sunday. And so, Abbott, would you please grace us with your presence, words, and admonitions. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. As Ken said, this is Plug-In Sunday. We have new sign-up sheets on the horseshoe table here in the Narthex. These are for things that make our Sunday morning experience together just a little nicer. We need things like greeters and liturgists and communion servers. We especially need Sunday school teachers and coffee chat hosts and people to donate flowers to decorate the communion table. Um, so after church today, on your way out the door, stop by and see me. It's very easy to sign up. In fact, just this morning, do you know who signed up to be a coffee chat host? Maggie Baca. Maggie, how old are you? Okay, she's 10, guys. <laughs> All right, what? so let's get these sheets signed up and then I can stop bugging you guys about it. Wonderful, all right. Maggie, have you, what, what, what do you think of serving at coffee chat? Have you given it some thought or you need some time? Donuts, donuts are good, okay. Very good. Thank you very much for signing up and for doing that and leading the way. As Jesus said, a child will lead us, and that's uh, exactly what's happening. So, take a deep breath. Yesterday, we had a celebration of life service for Joyce Dooley, and uh, we had over 200 people. The family thought that... Uh, there would be 75 to 100. It was over double that in attendance. And over and over again, they remarked how much they appreciated the hospitality of this place, how much they appreciated the work that uh, people who did not even know the family stepped up and helped with things. Hospitality, generosity, kindness, the view out these windows, being in each other's company, all of these things add to our experience of the holy and our sense of belonging. And so when we take a deep breath, we are inhaling that truth, that reality. So the spirit of life and love is with us. So Barb, would you please call us together? Please stand if you're comfortably able. Let there be joy in our coming together this day. Let there be help and healing for our disharmony and despair. So let us celebrate the richness and diversity of life.
life and love, as we settle into this sacred time, help us to put away the pressure of the world that asks us to perform, to take up masks, to put on brave fronts. Silence the voices that ask us to be perfect. Through your love, may we let ourselves make ourselves be a community of compassion and belonging. May all the people say amen. Good morning, I'm Liz Curry, president of the Shadow Rock Board. It is my privilege to lead us together in the reciting of our covenant, and I would ask that you would all stand if you're comfortably able as we honor our covenant. Together, we covenant one with another to be that sensitive and responsive part of human society, which perceives and responds to God's newest thrust in the midst of history. The uniqueness and greatness of every life is radically affirmed. Our task together demands a comprehensive view of life, always pointed intentionally to the future. Our life together involves us individually and corporately in study and worship, always maintaining a proper balance between proclamation of the word about life with the deeds which make life good. Those activities which eliminate age barriers, cut across religious dogma, reduce cultural parochialisms, and engage secular people with life's ultimate possibilities will be worthy of our best efforts. Thank you. Stay standing. In this day made fresh, may we embrace this day with hope. Let us embrace each other in peace.
you, you are correct, there is a song, but uh, I'm going to read this small, brief passage first, and then we'll uh, sing the song, um, uh, won't, uh, the servant song. The word about life uh, comes from John chapter 13, uh, and it's, uh, it's, very, it's very brief, unlike the sermon. <laughs> stop. <laughs> Just stop. From John chapter 13. I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let's sing uh, the servant song. Indeed, we will share uh, the joy and the sorrow till we've seen this journey through. So last Sunday was Epiphany, and it was a Sunday which is characterized by the images of the Magi, uh, these three characters that are looking at a star, and the star is guiding them to the place of Jesus. I suggested that we use a question as our guiding star as we move forward as a congregation. And again, I offer for further conversation and consideration the question, what is the future we want to create together? When we enter these conversations with this guiding star question hanging over us, showing us the way, it can help frame our conversations with each other. It can also, I hope, adjust our thinking. Now, one of the biggest adjustments in our thinking is that instead of seeing our current circumstances in terms of problems to be solved, we can think of our challenges as possibilities for the future that we want to create. Let's take a teachable moment in the life of Jesus as an example. Jesus and his disciples are walking along, and there they see a blind man. And the disciples say to Jesus, Tell us about this blind man, being a prophet and all. Is this man blind because of the sin in his life, or is he blind because of the sin in his parents' life? And Jesus says, Neither. This man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God, God's works might be revealed in him. I want us to be careful here. What sin in their life caused the suffering? 
We want to think of this as a moral question loaded with judgment. And it has that potential. But that question from the disciples was first and foremost a cause and effect question. That we think that if we can understand suffering in terms of its cause and effect, then we can cope with it. It is somehow justified. It, then it becomes more okay. And in addition to that, if we understand suffering in terms of, of cause and effect, then perhaps we can fix the problem. But in this teachable moment, Jesus is saying, get out of your old cause and effect thinking and think about it in a new way. This man's blindness is not a problem to be solved. Instead, it is an opportunity for light to shine through his darkness and love to break through his isolation. We may say that it is a chicken and egg kind of thing, but I want to say that the chicken is the way that the egg reproduces itself. We got to think about it differently. Jesus was calling on a major inversion of their thinking. This involves a major inversion of our thinking. This involves a serious level of self-awareness about how we see the world and how we orient ourselves to life and how we see the world and orient ourselves to life is in fact our spirituality. Now, we talk a lot about inclusion, and we talk a lot about justice, and it's much easier for us to put our values of inclusion and justice into action and to develop programs around them and ministries around them. It is more difficult, though, to name and to define, to share and build programs around our core value of spirituality. But it is our spirituality it is the way that we see life. It is the way we orient ourselves to life. Is it an enemy or is it a friend? Is it a curse or is it a gift? Is it something to be endured or is it something that is full of surprises and joy? If not in this moment, then around the corner. That is our spirituality and that is the ground from which the flowers of inclusion and justice are nurtured. Problem solving is a spirituality in itself. We like to think of ourselves as problem solvers. We want to identify the problem, analyze the problem, weigh the various solutions, decide on the best solution, Design the solution, execute the solution, evaluate the results, make adjustments, and then observe, plan, execute, evaluate, and repeat the process until we get the levels of results that we want. This spirituality has defined Western civilization for several centuries and has improved the quality of life for millions of people for ages. However, it is not the spirituality for every challenge. In the teachable moment of Jesus, his followers and the blind man, Jesus was inviting the disciples to move away from the spirituality of problem solving to a spirituality of possibility. Let's look at some other examples. We can see a group of unemployed young men as a risk to our society. I remember walking down the street in a part of town in Evansville, Indiana, when I was part of the mental health center there and was part of a homeless outreach team. And we're walking down the sidewalk and there on the corner are a group of young men that in my youth and whiteness felt 
a little bit of fear. Now, this says much more about me than it does about them. But the person I was walking with was the pastor of a church just down the block. And it was as if he could read my mind. And what he said when he saw them, he goes, Oh, my God, look at these incredible, incredible young men of God. He confronted my social work problem-solving spirituality. That instead of seeing them as a challenge that demanded more police and more prison space, that in fact they were incredible men of God who had yet been given the opportunity to love and to serve. Let's think about it in terms of our own congregation and our own visioning process. What happens up here in between us? The performance creates the experience? Or do you, the congregation, create the experience? We can think in terms of how we can change the actors, the dynamics, the behaviors, and what happens up here on the chancel, or we can focus on what happens in the hearts and the minds of the people in the pews and who it is that you bring when you come to this time and place. I'll give you another one. The parent creates the child. Or the child creates the parent. We think in terms of offering the children and youth programs, and then the parents will come. We think in terms of teaching the children and inviting the parents. But Jesus did just the opposite. Jesus taught the parents and invited the children. But the parents had to be willing to be taught. They had to recognize their own hunger and their need and their desire to grow. Last Sunday, my grandson delighted us. Right before the sermon, he fulfilled the wish of many people here. <laughs> he got up and left and said, Bye! And we think we want more of that. And we do. We think that the lack of children among us is a problem to be solved. We worked this challenge as a problem to be solved for years at the cost of tens of thousands of dollars. We want lots of kids being themselves, interrupting the serious adults, grounding us back to our humanity, making us laugh, bringing joy into our time together. Of course we want that. But this is not the reason for children and youth ministries. The delight they bring us is the byproduct of their presence among us. But what are the possibilities for them and their parents, what is the future we want to create together? Other examples of shifting from a spirituality of problem solving to a spirituality of possibility includes the boss creates the subordinates. Or the subordinates create the boss. The leader creates the members. Or the members create create the leader. The space determines how it is occupied or a space is created by the way it is occupied. Haven't we just proven that over the last couple of weeks? That we have enhanced our sense of belonging and intimacy and connection by simply taking our butts and moving them closer together. We created space. It didn't create us. 
The teacher creates the student, or the student creates the teacher. Is education designed more for learning, or is it designed more for teaching? The speaker creates the listener, or the listener creates the speaker. I contend that because you are such good listeners, it brings out the best in me as a speaker. See, we can apply this kind of shift to everything in our life. Do we create our health or does our health create us? Does our relationships define who we are or do we define our relationships? The kind of student I am is because of the school I attend and the teachers I have. Or the school I attend and the teachers I have are because of the kind of student I am. Well, of course, our lives are complicated. And there is an interplay of internal and external dynamics. But hopefully we get the point. The list could go on and on. In each case, when we shift and reverse our thinking the focus of attention and effort gets redirected. The possibility of a spirituality of possibility is created. This is a shift in power. The power in this shift is that it confronts us with our own freedom and we cannot exercise our freedom without also owning our responsibility. It is out of this freedom, which all of us have ways of sidestepping and escaping, that authentic accountability and responsibility is born. This is the source of the power that is needed if we are going to create a future together. You have that power. And we're going to talk more about that next week. Amen. Well, we have much to celebrate. There is much that always going on in the lives of our people as well as the life of our congregation. If you have a celebration, it can be a birthday, it can be an anniversary, it could be perhaps you were surprised by grace. I invite you to stand and let an usher come to you with a microphone so we can all share in that. So we'll start on this side. And then we'll move across the room in this way. So, all right. And we'll start with Cindy. Good morning, Cindy. Good morning. Those of you who knew my father know that my birthday on January 1st cost him a deduction <laughs> 65 years ago. That's, that's, that's right. <laughs> Happy birthday. Barb. Um, a while ago, I mentioned that my daughter had started a store in California, a furniture kind of store, and uh, we had to close that because it wasn't successful enough after about six months. But amazingly, uh, she put her resume out there on those job boards, and someone found her within a week, and she's starting a new job this week, doing what she loves to do, help people furnish their homes, but it's not her stuff now, it's the store stuff. So she's Wonderful. going to be... Hopefully, very successful at that. We hope God so. God helped That's us. That's good. That's good. Thank you, Barb. Susan. Good morning. I'm Susan Glenn, and uh, last August, I put on the prayer list a family member, Morgan, who was three years old at the time but turned four. She was diagnosed with liver cancer, and she received treatment for a couple of weeks uh, at the Phoenix Children's Hospital with chemo, and they did tell her with the chemo she would lose her hearing, which unfortunately she did. But by the grace of God, her mother took sign language in college. So, you know, they're doing very well, and she's doing well. At the same time, since her treatment wasn't 100% successful, she was put on the list for a liver transplant. And they've been waiting since, I would say, November for a liver. And since she's only four years old, it was really hard here in Phoenix to find another child the same age and size. So they actually took her off the transplant list here 
and put her on in California at the L.A. Children's Hospital. In the meantime, her grandmother, Martha, Morgan's grandmother, came down with brain cancer. So they, they actually were both in treatment for cancer at the same time and hospitalized. Uh, last week, a liver became available, and Morgan was flown over by a generous pilot at no cost to them for a transplant, and uh, it was done this week. It was successful. She is recovering in L.A. She's in the transplant unit and will be home, you know, in a few weeks with her family. And the people that sent cards, because uh, she was on our prayer list, we really appreciate it. Uh, the family form team m and &M, for Morgan and Martha. So, you know, they're both doing well in treatment, and we just thank you for all your prayers and support. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Keep us updated on Team m and &M. Thank you. All right. Alison, welcome Happy back. Happy New Year, everyone. I'll tell you, it was a moment of a great to come back to church this morning and be so welcomed by such a loving community. It really means a lot to have a community to come back to. So I have to say that. A second moment of grace in my life, um, I've been struggling for the last few years trying to get some things done around the house. And Carolyn, who's been taking care of my cats, has agreed to stay and help me get some of that done. So I'm really thrilled with that, that, that I will get some things done. But the big news is, you know, of course, everybody knows I went over to Germany for... Um, the birth of a new grandchild. And uh, most of you know how I am into natural birth, everything natural. Well, this baby is a high-tech baby, very expensive, and after 24 hours of very, very hard labor, uh, Alyssa finally had an epidural, and that didn't produce any results. Even after she was at 10 centimeters, the baby just wasn't dropping. And the doctor did a little look. He said, well, the baby wouldn't put her head down to tuck. So he thought, well, maybe a C-section was in order. And, of course, Alyssa was in tears because that wasn't her birth plan at all. But they took her over there, and um, we had a little bit of heaven that arrived. Uh, Ellison Leonora came in at 6 pounds, 5 ounces, and she had the cord wrapped around her neck twice. So had they done any more natural uh, effects, Ellison wouldn't be with us. So I've got pictures. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. It's a great word. Reverend Leona Rowe. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to celebrate that the Arizona Legislative District 24 has elected someone who is a full-time wheelchair user. The first ever full-time wheelchair user to be elected to our legislature. She has a seat in the House. It is Representative Jennifer Longden. Some of you may know or remember her when she visited with us. And uh, when she was first elected, there was not a single accessible bathroom in the House building. And her prospects were to have to wheel over to the Senate building when she needed to use facilities. In the meantime, the Democratic Caucus and the uh, building managers at, in the House and Senate buildings have retrofitted all of the doors to be accessible with push-button openers, have retrofitted all of the bathrooms in both buildings to be wheelchair accessible, and the elevators adapted for wheelchair users. So having voices like yours out in the community advocating for inclusion and justice means a lot. Changes can happen even if they seem so small to us. And that is my celebration that you Thank all you. are really powerful. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Sharon. Hi. Um, many of you probably remember my daughter, Kelsey Struckmeyer, who was raised here at Shadow Rock. Um, she has been diagnosed with a benign growth in her brain. It's called a colloid cyst, and she's going to have it endoscopically removed in Denver on March 1st. So I know that she'll appreciate thinking of you cards. Um, Lois said that she'll send them to my house, and I'll make sure that 
um, they're hand delivered to Kelsey. So. Thank you, and keep us updated, please. Okay, so thank you for sharing, so we add it to our prayers. Yes. Hi, Roy Zebrowski. I just, um, as an usher this morning, I want to thank everyone. I didn't have, we didn't say a word to anyone about sitting in the center. You guys are wonderful. This is much more energy in here. I hear it even in the back of the room, so thank you for that. And it also makes doing the collection and everything else <laughs> so much easier. Thank you so much. Yes, so, so when everyone is sitting together like this, Roy, and the, and the ushers are able to, to hear and feel the energy when they're in the bride's room drinking coffee. <laughs> Is that right? I just... Okay. All right. Let's sing our celebration song. All right. <laughs> <coughs> Offerings for the celebration of life in this place and beyond, for the furthering of justice, inclusion, and spirituality, shall now be received.
let us embrace the wonder of this coming week with expectation and imagination. These are the times. All of creation is blessed. May God be with you. Amen.